Hi, my name is David Dalton. I am an application scientist at Lakeshore Cryotronics, and today I'm going to talk to you about materials characterization at terahertz frequencies. So we'll start today's talk uh, by defining what exactly is terahertz. And so, by definition, at one terahertz is just 10 to the 12 hertz. Um, but for our purposes, terahertz is actually just a slice of the electromagnetic spectrum um, that lies between the millimeter uh, and infrared regions of the, uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and so historically, we've had sources of uh, radiation on either side of this, re uh, this regime, the terahertz gap, so to say. And so for, uh, electronic sources have traditionally been used uh, to get to the millimeter ranges, and as well as thermal sources have been used uh, to come down from the infrared size. Um, in both cases, though, there just simply haven't been enough photons in the terahertz, uh, the terahertz regime. And so this lack of uh, terahertz sources and detectors really left a gap in our understanding of physical phenomena that occurs uh, at these frequencies. So um, that's changed a lot in the last 20 years, and so there's a bevy of modern uh, terahertz sources, both electronic sources, being backwards wave oscillators and Schottky diodes, um, and also on the light side, be it infrared sources, quantum cascade lasers, um, and one of my favorites is the photoconductive uh, Austin switch. So with these modern sources of terahertz radiation, this terahertz gap is now what I would consider no longer a terahertz gap, but actually a terahertz frontier. So we wanted to define what is terahertz. Uh, we just have a few words that we can use to, to understand that. So terahertz really is a relatively unexplored region of the electromagnetic spectrum in which we hope to find new physical phenomena and materials as well as um, come across new material characterization methods and develop those ma uh, material characterization methods. So to understand that a little bit better, what we want to do is we want to go back and we want to unpack um, some of the conventional optical characterization techniques that have been used in materials for, for many, many years. Uh, and so when we think about conventional optical characterization techniques, what we want to think about is we have an observable, and those observables include things like reflection and transmission, as well as absorption, ellipsometry, uh, as well as the uh, angular scattering of light. Uh, as light interacts with the material. And from those observables, what we're able to do is, depending on the frequency of light, is uh, derive physical properties of a given material from those observables. And those, depending again, depending on the energy or frequency or wavelength of the light, could include things like the crystal structure, the band structure of the material, um, all the way down into the magnetic excitations uh, that go on in, in certain materials. So the overall thesis of uh, this part of the talk is really that physical properties of materials are going to couple to different frequencies of light or different energies of light. Right? And so we have a few examples of that. Um, and before we get to those examples, um, it's really helpful to, to understand that different scientists use different optical scales uh, or different units for uh, the measurement of light. And so uh, one of those, those units, of course, is uh, in energy. And so we think about the energy of light. So the energy is just proportional to the, the frequency of the light. And the proportionality constant is just this H that you see in the equation there, which is just Planck's constant. Uh, and so a lot of materials physicists will, will work in energy scales. Um, when we talk about light, one of the other things that a lot of people talk about is the wavelength of the light. That's just really uh, it's inversely proportional to the frequency of light, and so higher frequency light has shorter wavelengths, whereas lower frequency light has longer wavelengths. And so we typically measure the wavelength uh, in many different units uh, of length uh, from millimeters all the way down to nanometers. And finally, the last uh, of our optical scales that we want to talk about is the spectroscopic wave number. And it's just uh, an inverse relation uh, to the wavelength of light. And that's used a lot in spectroscopy by chemists uh, as well as uh, physical uh, spectroscopists. And uh, the typical unit is inverse centimeters. Okay. All right. So some of the examples that we have of different wavelengths of light coupling to different physical phenomena uh, start actually at the very highest energy region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we can think about X-ray diffraction, which way in which the wavelength of light uh, sort of sits between about 0.1 to 1 nanometers. And that's actually the length scale in which atoms in a crystal uh, order themselves in it. So the distance between atoms in a, in a crystal are about a, f uh, a few nanometers uh, apart. And so when we shine X-ray light onto, onto a surface and actually look at the angular scattering of, of that X-ray radiation, we're actually able to derive the crystal lattice spacing or the spacing between atoms uh, in that material. Now, of course, 
we shine longer wavelength light onto a material uh, that the wavelength is entirely too long to uh, to derive that information so this is one of the uh, physical observables that you can only really get from x-ray diffraction if we go down in energy from x-ray diffraction down into the ultraviolet uh, uh, regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. The, the ultraviolet regime has a longer wavelength um, and is actually less energetic than the x-rays. And so um, while we're unable to resolve uh, atomic structure in a material, uh, ultraviolet radiation actually has enough energy in which case you actually can uh, rip off electrons from, uh, from atoms inside of the, the crystal. And so by using ultraviolet radiation to, to eject electrons from a material, we were able to derive some of the energies of those electrons uh, in the material and actually derive band structure of the material. And so this is really important uh, when it comes to understanding the electronic structure of a material and how uh, a material is going to, to, to operate. You actually have to understand the, uh, the band structure. So that's um, a little bit less energy than x-rays, but still fairly energetic enough to be able to, to pull uh, electrons out of material. Uh, if we go down uh, a little bit further into the electromagnetic spectrum, we're now into the UV visible region of the spectrum. Um, and so this is the, the visible region of, of light where we can, we can see objects and that's what our eyes are accustomed to. Um, it turns out that the U, uh, UV vis region of the electromagnetic spectrum is actually commensurate with the energy scales that we find in the band gap of many semiconductors. And so what this means is that by shining uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation from the visible part of the spectrum onto a semiconductor, what you're able to do is you're able to promote uh, electrons uh, from the valence band of that semiconductor and uh, promote them into the conduction band of the semiconductor. Um, this promotion process actually corresponds with an absorption of that radiation, of, uh, that wavelength uh, or that energy of radiation of light. And so certain, uh, certain semiconductor materials which have very small uh, band gaps, for example, the, the indium arsenides and the indium antimonides uh, are going to absorb uh, radiation all the way from the, the far red all the way through the, the UV region. Whereas wider band gap semiconductors, for example, diamond, actually have very broad uh, band gaps. And so they're actually going to absorb uh, only the, the highest energy or the UV uh, region of light. And so Now we're going to move uh, a little bit farther down in energy to, to longer wavelengths uh, into the IR region of light. And so in the IR region of light uh, our wavelengths are now between about 1 and uh, 100 microns. And so these are actually fairly uh, fairly long wavelengths. And the energy that corresponds with IR radiation in fact um, is commensurate with what are called phonons. And phonons are really crystal lattice vibrations. And so if you think about um, in, in a crystal lattice, you have uh, two different atoms, uh, the red atoms and say the green atoms. Uh, and those are actually going to vibrate inside of the crystal. And so when I shine IR wavelength light onto my crystal, uh, when the frequency of the IR radiation matches the frequency of these atom-atom uh, uh, vibrations in your crystal, you're actually able to absorb that uh, that wavelength of light. And so in doing this, what you're able to do is you're able to uh, find out something about the crystal vibrations that are going on inside uh, inside of your, your material. We're going to go to uh, a little bit lower in energy, uh, skipping over the terrorist regime, and go to our lowest re uh, energy region of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're talking about today, and that's in the, the RF and microwave region. Um, and so this is such low energy and such long wavelengths of light that these, uh, these can couple to very low energy excitations. And one of the, the more important of those low energy excitations is actually magnetic resonances. And so uh, the two examples that I give you are, are that of um, magnetic resonance imaging, which is uh, used in hospitals all over the world, as well as the electron paramagnetic resonance, which will tell you a little bit about chemical structure um, uh, of materials. So we, we've, we've looked throughout the entire electromagnetic spectrum and we've realized in, that you know, different uh, physical properties of the electromagnetic spectrum couple to different energies of light. And one of the more important things that we, we want to unpack from this is that 
for most materials, terahertz frequency light really isn't going to directly couple to these typical physical properties. Um, and so we have other conventional probes to, to couple to those properties, um, but terahertz simply doesn't couple to, to these conventional pro most of these conventional properties. Um, but the really good news is that there's an entire region of the electromagnetic spectrum in which um, terahertz uh, energy radiation actually can couple to new phenomenon. Uh,